Balaha Chautauqua. We are live. We are live in the flesh. I'm coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, you might be able to see behind me this fancy little gaudy room that I'm hanging out in. Um, where I'm staying, they were kind enough to let me uh, to let me use this room. Guys, we are on a roll with the Palaha Chautauqua, and I'm going to cut to the chase because I've got some very, very special people who are dear to my heart that are going to join me today to talk to me and to you about the concept and the idea of faithfulness. And what we've been doing over the past two months here on the Palaha Chautauqua is talking about um, this idea of the full expression of the human experience. So what does it mean to be fully, truly alive? What does it mean to be living a life where you are giving people the taste of heaven, whatever way you want to contextualize heaven, whether it's from the Judeo-Christian standpoint or whether it's just from this idea of like paradise on earth, utopia, like how do we, um, how do we live a life that's basically kingdom living lives? And a kingdom living life is a life that when you interact with it, it changes you for the better. It makes you uh, gentler and kinder and more patient and it fills you with wisdom and peace and love and joy and faithfulness. And what is faithfulness? Um, it's easy to talk about it in terms of, of the black and white stuff, which we can do, but then to see it in evidence, to see it in action is a very different thing. So uh, I want to welcome you guys. I want to thank Danny Virtue and Casey Wright for last week for opening themselves up to us and telling their story. And Danny's got this amazing story on self-control that's a very, very different story. And he's going to come back one day and, and I'm going to dedicate a whole uh, show to him because he's led this incredible life. And so you'll hear more from Danny Virtue. Um, but with uh, no further ado, let's get on with the show. So faithfulness, guys, as defined by Webster's Dictionary, is steadfast in affection or allegiance, loyal, a faithful friend. It also is defined as a firm adherence to promises or in observance of duty, conscientious, a faithful employee. It's also defined as given with strong assurance, so binding, a faithful promise, something that is binding, something that's conscientious, something that is loyal. Um, the fourth definition that Webster's offered for the word faithfulness is true to the facts, to a standard, or to an original. A faithful uh, hard drive has high fidelity, it means that it's truthful to the original coding or a song. Uh, when you record music, there's high fidelity, so it's faithful to the original sound, a faithful copy. Um, I found this thing online, which is just crazy and kind of fun, and so I figured you guys should hear it. Um, take a listen. It's asking you Faithfulness is the concept of unfailingly remaining loyal to someone or something and putting that loyalty into consistent practice, regardless of extenuating circumstances. It may be applied to a husband or wife who, in a sexually exclusive marriage, does not engage in sexual relationships outside of the marriage, a customer at a restaurant who regularly dines there, or even to God himself with regard to his perpetual love towards his children that is not dependent on their worthiness. It could also mean keeping to one's promises no matter the prevailing circumstances. Literally, it is the state of being full of faith and a somewhat archaic sense of steady devotion to a person, thing or concept. Its etymology is distantly related to that of fidelity. Indeed, in modern electronic devices, a machine with high fidelity is considered faithful to its source material, whereas a spouse who, inside a sexually exclusive relationship, has sexual relations outside of marriage could equally be considered as being unfaithful as having committed infidelity. There you go. There you go. The computer, the fidelity, the faithful computer. So faithfulness, then, is to be full of faith or fidelity, as that was then. So true to something or someone, true to a person, but you can be true to an idea, you can be true to a goal, you can be true to yourself, true to a dream. So that's where 
it starts to become like, well, let's start defining what it is we're talking about. So then if faithfulness is to be full of faith, what exactly is faith? Faith. I'm going to go to the Bible for this one, the old good book. And in Hebrews 11, 1, and I'm going to read you several different, I'm going to read you one, two, three, four different translations of the exact same verse because it's so fascinating to me how each um, definition and word, the verbiage, when it changes just a little bit, it gives you this almost a 3D glow uh, view of what it is we're talking about. So Hebrews 11.1 1, in the New uh, International Version says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The New Living Translation has it. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. English Standard Version says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then the Berean Study Bible, or Berean Study Bible, forgive me for not knowing what that word is, supposed to sound like it says now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see so I want to do this again real quick assurance evidence conviction certainty assurance evidence conviction certainty of things we cannot see that's faith so the idea of faithfulness is that you're hoping for something that you can't see um, so my thing is that it's, 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 I think, that faithfulness is following blindly something you can't see going somewhere you don't know. So without no further ado, I have two guests lined up, and they have really, really special stories about faithfulness, and I can't wait for you guys to hear them. My first guest is new to my life. I met him this year, but suddenly and, um, and, and irrefutably, he and his girlfriend have become very, very close to me and my entire family. Um, we worked together filming Jurassic World here in Canada back in February, and then we spent the entire summer and the early fall together in the UK filming, um, and I was his right-hand man. I was like his little henchman. Um, I can officially call Scott Hayes my friend. We could have been brothers because when I was in college, my stage name, I was going to change Palaha to Hayes, H-A-Z-E, just like him, but uh, I went with the harder, much harder to pronounce Palaha. Um, Scott's an incredible actor. In fact, he's probably one of the best actors I've ever worked with. Talk about faithfulness. He loses weight for roles. He goes to f extremes. I'll let him share with you the extremes that he's taken for the parts that he's played. But um, you can find him in movies like Child of God or William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying or The Sound of the Fury. Uh, thank you for your service. Venom. You guys know Venom. Uh, he currently can be seen in Guillermo del Toro's Antlers. And then, of course, he's going to have his own Lego for his upcoming role in Jurassic World. He also started a theater in NoHo area, the art section in Los Angeles, called the Sherry Theater, named after his mama. Um, he's an extremely talented actor. It was fun working with him. But to me, the greatest thing that he's done is directed a documentary called Mully. And you can see it, and it's actually going to be released in February. And I want to have Scott back on in February, maybe, if we're lucky, to really, really get into how he got involved in that. But Molly is about this man in Africa who, well, lived a life of faithfulness. And it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to, um, to keep talking about it. So I'm going to go ahead and let Scott, and he's joining us today from the Molly Family Foundation USA page. So if you guys want to go ahead and give that a follow, there he is. What's up, Scott Hayes? Hey, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm good. This is my first time doing anything like this. On <laughs> I'm sorry that I've roped you in. To a, it's no, it's, 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 it's awesome. And, and, and that's just so good. to. I just appreciate the words you just said, brother. Like, I consider you such a close friend. And it's just amazing what you have with this community you've grown on here. And I, I've been watching as a, as a fan of this, this Instagram live event. And it's, it's just great, man. It's good to see you, and it's good to be here to talk about Molly. Well, thank you for, thank you for sharing your Sunday afternoon with all of us, brother. Of course. Um, well, you, first off, the movie's incredible. And when you said you made a documentary, I was like, okay, that's cool. But, like, the fact that it was in Africa, the fact that it's about this guy. And then when I saw the documentary, 
I was like, did you win Oscars for this? Like, how did this play out in the world? Because it's that unbelievable. It's such an, a, it's a beautiful documentary. But then the story about this guy is literally like, it's what I'm talking about, Kingdom Living. And so do you mind just walking the people? Can you just tell Molly's story real quick? Yeah, so Molly is a story that you would basically think you'd find in some fable or story tale book about that Disney would have written about some guy who's, if you could change the world, how would you change the world? And he is, and his wife, their partnership, they're up. Uh, let me start at the beginning. So Molly was an orphan and he was left for dead by his own family in a, in a, in a, a small hut outside of Kenya. In, in Kenya, outside of Nairobi. And he was basically, as a young boy, he was an orphan who lived off the streets and he got into trouble. He was stealing for food and begging and nobody would take him in and he was living on the streets. And it was, it was as harsh of the conditions as you can imagine a child to go through. Being abandoned by your own family at the, at the very young age of six, you are just, you wake up and, and you have to fend like, for yourself. Like they left him in the middle of the night. Right? Like they just left him in the middle of the night. The, the idea was that the uncle would take care of him, but the uncle was, was an alcoholic and was not able to be there for him. So he was basically an orphan, which is, it's a very common thing in Kenya. This is, this is a, a very serious problem where there's so many orphans. Um, so it's, it's, it's a huge thing and he was one of them. And he worked extremely hard and he put himself well, let me back it up. He was, he was about to take his own life when he was 15 years old. And a buddy that he, uh, one of the street kids kind of invited him into a church. And he sat in this church and he listened to the pastor preach. And he was really, he didn't, he didn't want to buy into what they were saying. He was on the verge of suicide. He didn't want to be in the church. And the pastor said something along the lines of, through faith and hard work, anything is possible. And he heard the word faith, which I know that uh, we're talking about faithfulness today, and yeah. your hard work. And then anything is possible is, is, the, is the miracle of Molly, because all those anything possibles have been occurring. So long story short, he meets the, the woman of his dreams, this beautiful woman named Esther, and they start uh, a marriage early on. And, and he starts to get a job, and he gets another job, and he, he buys his own Matatu company, which is it, it basically you buy five or six taxis in New York City. That's what he did. So he was now driving and making some money and transporting people back and forth. And it kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. And cut to long story short is he, he was, became one of the most successful men in oil and gas in all of Kenya. One of the wealthiest, most successful men. Yeah. One day he was going in to do some business and some street kids asked him for some change, like a normal beggars would on the street, just like he was. He didn't give it to him, and he came back and his Mercedes was stolen by those same street kids. So he had to take his own Matatu, because now he owned the Matatu company. He had to take his own bus back to his mansion. And on that drive, and over, the, over a period of time, which we kind of shrunk down for the film, it was more than just a drive. Um, he felt that God was talking to him, and he felt God was saying, kept giving him these visions about what he, God wanted his life to look like and what he wanted God, what God wanted to do in his life. So one day after work, he, he got in his Mercedes and he found himself almost to Uganda. And he pulled over on the side of the road and he had, the way he words it is he wrestled with God for hours and to where God took him down and beat him. So he lost that wrestling match and he realized, oh, I have to answer God's calling on my life. And like, I, I just get emotionally even thinking about like that kind of faithfulness to have that kind of moment and then completely redirect your life. Because what he did following that is he went home to his eight biological children and his wife over dinner said, I, and they thought he was out of his mind. He said, I'm no longer gonna work for money. I'm going to devote my life to taking care of the street kids and, and the people in need in our country. Okay. And they well, thought he, yeah, yeah. Push pause just for a second. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're at the moment where he's about to go and do this thing. I just want to reiterate something. So here's a kid, wasn't born a Christian. His dad, no. his mom, in the middle of the night, the mom and the other brothers and sisters left. And he woke up alone in his house at six, walked over to his uncle's house, his hut. And his uncle kicked him away, shoot him away. 
and he was a street urchin, homeless, contemplating suicide all the time. And there's that beautiful part in your documentary where he's like down the river and he was going to drown himself in the river. Yeah. And he goes to a church and here's faith and hard work. And then he becomes, and it's not just like he, he bought a couple taxis and then he owned the taxi company and then he owned the oil and gas. <clears throat> like he became like a multi, multi millionaire, right? Like one of the richest dudes. And you, in your documentary, you had it that he was the first house to be built of brick. Yeah. Like, it's the first like strong structure in the entire town or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here's a guy that had a 100% 180. Okay, so now we've reiterated all that. So now he goes home, he's got his own kids. And he says what to his family? He says, I'm no longer going to work for money. I'm going to close all my businesses. And from this day forward, I'm going to devote my life to what God has asked me to do, which is taking care of the needy, the poor, the homeless, the prostitutes. And that night he went to Kibera slum. Kibera is a, it's the world's largest slum and it's right outside of Nairobi. And it's, it's, it's horrific. It's, it's the, it's, it's where there's no future tense in people's vocabulary. There's, there is no future tense. You've been there. Um, filmed there? Yeah, we, we filmed there. He went there and he grabbed three young girls who were prostitutes at the age of six and eight and nine. These are girls that were prostituting at that age. And he brought them back to his home. And his wife looked at him and said, he's like, these are our new, our new children. And she looked at him like, what do you mean these are our new children? You just brought these three children off the street. And he's like, yes, we are going to take care of these kids. And he kept doing it. And he kept doing it. And he kept doing it. He got, his got ostracized from his church. They said, you're no longer welcome here. You're bringing these street kids around here. And these street kids are filthy. These are kids who just didn't have parents, who didn't have love, who for sure didn't have future tense in their vocabulary yet. And he brought them into his home. And by the end of the first year, there was about 350 kids living in his mansion. That's crazy. Crazy. That's so then, he, then he expands his mansion and starts building and building and building. And it keeps growing and growing and growing. He, he creates a school. He creates an, um, a rehabilitation program for the women to come in that have been abused. And uh, it's really, domestic violence is a really big problem in Kenya, and especially um, in the surrounding areas of Nairobi. There's a lot of alcoholism and people are just really abusive to women. And, and he's created programs and to help women find safe, safe shelter during those moments. And it, it's, it's such an, it, I know we have, we're limited on time. So he called it Mully Children's Family. And it started very humble and it grew and grew and grew. And long story short, he has rescued over 25,000 children. They all call him dad. They all are there. You know, their, their lives are completely transformed. How many kids? Over 25,000. He's, it's around 13, but 25,000 over the course of his, his journey. It's, it's, it's miraculous. And, and I, I, you know, I'm kind of going to spoil the whole documentary for everybody. You can watch it on Amazon right now. And I'm excited to come back on in February. And, and I'm going to try to get Molly to come on to this. You, yeah, we would with, love that, man. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I would love that. Will you tell me, I, I don't want to spoil too much because I do want people to go check this thing out. And it's, and, and I don't know if you want people to go now to Amazon and, and, and watch it now or if they should wait till February. I'll let you kind of call the shots on that or they could do both and share it in yeah. February. And I mean, it's a word of mouth thing. So the more you guys support it, the more you guys watch it and talk about it, obviously, the more people that sees it, the better. It's, the, the, the message is incredible. Um, will you, so to me, like the Bible is just ripe with people who, who, were motivated by faithfulness. So you have Abraham walked away from his family into the desert because he was the first person in human history to hear from this one God versus, you know, pantheistic gods. And it said, go into the desert. So Abraham goes, Noah builds an ark. Moses leads his people out of the wilderness. Um, Jesus gets on a cross. I mean, in the garden of Gethsemane, he's like, if I don't have to do this, but it was by faith that he was like, all right, I'll do this. I'll take on the sins of the world. Um, so here's a guy in our day and age that you've talked to that you've met and people are always like, well, why don't the Bible stories, like if it's something that's real, if God's real, why doesn't he show his face in the world anymore? And I'm, I'm going to make an argument that he is doing that loud and clearly. And in Molly's case, Will you tell us the story about, so the house that he built, this mansion, 
it got too populated, right? And the city kind of became unwelcoming. So he went and found this desert patch of land out in the- Yeah, there was, the there was this, there was a space, um, he had, he bought his retirement land in Delani, which is a little bit even further outside of Nairobi. His first place was in Eldoret, if anybody is familiar with Kenya. And he had this retirement land that Esther and himself, they, they were going to build their home there. Um, and yeah, the kids, there were too many kids living in this, this mansion. They expanded as much as they could and they realized to really make a difference, we need to, uh, we need to evolve as a, as a family, if you will. And they moved to a land where there was hardly any water. It was a really, um, it was a desolate desert type environment where water was very hard to come by. And so it was, it was a challenge at first. And we're talking about faithfulness today. And when he moved there, these children started to die of, of, of drinking water that was not safe to drink. People got sick. It was a very harsh time. And he says that his faith and the vision that God gave him would come to pass. And he stuck with it during the hard times. Even when the times when he he lost a child. He went and prayed all night, and then he, he went back the next day. And, I, and there's a really one of the best stories, one of the miracles of, of, his, of his life, and there's many miracles, is one day he felt that God had told him where the water was. And he woke up at 3 in the morning, and, and when you watch the documentary, you'll, you'll see how it plays out. But he went out there, and, and, and he, he walked to a certain place, and he felt like that is where the water was, and he started digging. The next day, he was still digging, and then he had his children come help, and then more children come help. And by about day two, they said, you know, we, we put borehole. There's no water here, Dad. There's no, you're out of your mind. He's like, trust me, there's water. Keep digging. And they dug, and they dug, and there was water. And it basically opened up the whole, and it was named Jacob's Well after one of the children who died who got sick. And there's stories like that in his life that are the face of face faithfulness in human form. Even though we can't see it, you can feel the supernatural spirit working it through Charles and Esther. And especially even when you go, you touch down on their ground, you can feel transformation and restoration and recovery and all the things that really people talk about doing, he's implemented. And one thing I'll say is if you go there now, and I was just talking about what a desert area it was, you, if you were to take a plane and fly over Molly Children's family, it might be raining. But if you, when you get to Nairobi in the plane, it won't be raining. And the reason why it's raining over Molly Children's family is he's created a microclimate. He's found a way to conserve water and, and save the trees and make it rain. And I know that sounds crazy, but he's created a microclimate by, by planting millions and millions of trees. Over the past 25 years, he's created his own microclimate is what he calls it it's it's, it's insane That's crazy yeah dude it's a, it's such a i remember watching it we watched it with some friends of ours and and i remember one of our friends was like oh i gotta show this to my dad i gotta show this to the whole like my whole family i mean it was like everybody who sees it uh how was it for you like here you are you're an actor like me and we're in hollywood california and you're in the white hot center like you, you've done some really awesome super high profile like if if anyone googles your name like you've worked with robert duvall you've worked with, i mean everybody like there's a huge list of, of really amazing guys you're really amazing. and i think the consensus is is that that faithfulness and hollywood don't really go hand in hand but you're walking that line where you're in the white hot center of it all and your heart is still you're still doing so like i think that your kingdom living having known you knowing your heart knowing the conversations that we've had um, and I would argue that there's an army being built and assembled for good and to tell stories that are um, encouraging and uplifting and not sappy and not cheesy and not preaching to the choir, but like, because life is hard. And I think this whole Chautauqua, the reason why this has been a lightning rod for people is because we're doing it during a pandemic where two point something, I think it's two point close to five million people have now died of COVID in one year, in less than one year. So we're, we're on the planet during a famine, during a pandemic, which is equivalent of like wartime, and we're faced with death. And I think people are reaching out saying like, there's gotta be more than just feeding myself and shopping online and watching my news and, and what is my purpose? 
And I think you're living a life that's purpose filled. I think Molly clearly is living a life. I mean, he, he had everything the world had to offer and he <clears throat> put his back on all of it and did this thing that's literally changed. You got to see the documentary because there's so many details that we're, that we're not able to really get into. And, um, yeah. Well, the thing is, for me, like when you're talking about Hollywood is, is that I, yeah, I've been in, I've, I've been really blessed and fortunate to work with some of the greatest actors I grew up admiring and, and loving and work in Marvel films and just, but when I, when I'm holding a camera and I'm seeing Charles pick up a child who has no hope for their life and they're on the brink of their own suicide. It, it kind of puts into perspective what really matters in such a drastic way that you can never, you know, can never go back. And for me, I can say about faithfulness is there was, it wasn't a time when, there was a time when my life was harder and I was going through a hard time. And I, I remember praying and just having faith that God would use me and, and use my, if I have any talent for something that would make the world a better place when I go. And, you know, my, I have a friend who I, I, I didn't, he wasn't my friend at the time, but his name's John Bardis. Him and his wife, Judy Bardis, are kind of the, they're the, the brains and the engine and the passion behind this. He just, he had a vision that he felt like God told him to tell the story. And he called me randomly. And I, I didn't know what, I never heard of Molly. And he said, and he just had faith in me. And his faith in me was enough for me to honor the project so much so that I devoted four years of my life to editing this film. And I, I was turning down acting work to edit this film. And, and it, it's, but when you see the impact we've had, the movie came out three years ago in a very limited space. And now we're about to go worldwide in February, which is one of the most exciting things in the world because when you really think about how small it is, the United States and, and the UK versus the whole globe is not gonna get experienced to Mully. It literally is, and I'm not just saying this because I directed the film and I'm, I'm part of the mission. This guy is, is Mother Teresa. He's out there really making a difference in a real world way where people talk a lot and, and, he, and he's doing it for real. Yeah. So to, to come on here and, and with, um, with, your, with what you're doing on here, it just seemed, it was perfect, man. So I'm so grateful that you even had me on here to talk about Molly and I can't wait to come back in February. And I. I promise you, I'm going to get Molly to come on here with you. I might have to wake him up and get him in here. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do it at another hour. So it'll be, we'll, we'll accommodate his, uh, what is it okay. that he would say to kids? He would go, oh, <clears throat> how does he say it? He says, oh, yeah. oh, and but, he used to do that because a lot of kids, when you see a grown man walking up to you on the street, it could be a suspect situation. You don't know what that man wants with you. And, and, which is what I loved about your documentary, because that's, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not going to ruin it, but you open and you're like, what is happening right now? <laughs> and then you realize that there's a, the way the world works and then there's kingdom living and the way that that world works. Kingdom living, right. and it's totally different. And it couldn't be safer and it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. It's um, exciting for the people that are gonna get exposed to the story um, through your fan base here. I think that they're really, they're really gonna love it. I really do. And I can't wait to hear their reactions when I come back on. Um, well, Scott, um, I appreciate it. I, I, I am going to let you go because I do want to bring on Angela today. But I also want to thank you so much for coming on and, and doing this. I know how seriously you take these things. and I know how um, weird and, and awkward these can be. And I have so much respect for you. And so I'm grateful that you shared your time with me today and your, and your talents and your heart. Well, let, let me say this, Chris. You, um, if anybody knows, we, we can't say anything about Jurassic World. But the, one of the biggest blessings, if not the biggest blessing of Jurassic World was my friendship with you and the impact you had on me personally and on my relationship and in my life. Like you are, I admire you. I admire this community you've built. I tune in, I will continue to tune in. I will tell people to tune in. Um, it, was just, it was just the best summer with you shooting Jurassic World. And I can't wait for people to see our work. It really was, man. Yeah. We built a family. We made we, we had a movie family. Mm -hmm. um, Will you hug Taylor from all of us and, 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 uh, and give yourself a pat on the back? And we will be in touch when we're back in L.A. Um, I, and, and definitely. And I'll have updates and keep so you can share with people all the Molly stuff. And okay. I did this I'll from the Molly. Yeah, I'll post stuff on the Chautauqua page and then on my personal page in February. And then 100% you're coming back in February. And um, we'll have a whole hour dedicated to you and Molly. And we'll go for it. That's amazing.
All right. Well, I appreciate you having me, brother. It's, yeah. it's always good to talk to you. All right, Scotty. Love you, man. Thank you for your Love work. you, man. Bye. All right. Bye. There you go, guys. Scott Hayes. If you don't know Scott's work, go check it out. He is truly, um, he's kind of like, this isn't, this isn't an easy compliment for me to give because I kind of want to be this guy too, but he's kind of like a, a Marlon Brando of sorts. Like he gets into the roles in such a way. He lost like 45 pounds for one of his roles. Anyway, um, so to go where you are led to go, faithfulness breeds trust, which is sometimes broken, right? But trust can be earned, and the good news is, is that it can be built back up. I know that that computer um, talked about infidelity and marriage, and I think faithfulness, the most relatable thing is if you're married and a faithfulness is broken, that creates an issue. But I'm here to say that, that you can also overcome that issue um, if you want to. Um, Angela is my next guest. Angela, I'm coming to you here in a minute. She has been friends with my wife, Julianne, for over 25 years. Um, and her faithfulness has led her along a path that has been oftentimes very complicated and very difficult and full of obstacles. But there was a point, a pivot point in her faithfulness where she kind of jettisoned, trusted herself and fell straight into trust with God. And it led to this life that I can't wait for you to share because again, Molly, we can't all be the richest guy in Kenya and own the oil and uh, gas and then save close to 30,000 orphans and change and have a microclimate that isn't what all of us have in our uh, in our wheelhouse, but we can't change one life, and Angela has done that. So I'm gonna bring Angela on if I can. Let me find her. Angela. Boom. Angela, I'm sending you a request. Boom. Hello, Angela. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you doing, girl? Good. Uh, you're going to make me cry with that intro. Well, Sweet. it's it's true, isn't it? God is good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I think the reason, there's two reasons that I wanted you to come on tonight specifically and talk about faithfulness. One is your involvement with House of Hope Orlando. And I know that they're having a big auction December 3rd. And so I want to say that right on the front end, and I'm going to remind people at the back end, and it's something that I've taken part in, because when you told me about what House of Hope is doing, it's just such extraordinary stuff, and it is kingdom living, and it's so specific, and it's like one of the only uh, nonprofits that Ronald Reagan publicly endorsed, Cameron Candace Bray, who's a big, uh, a lot of people who are watching this love her work, and I both are a part of your auction this year, and so that's something that you can do. Um, and so your faithfulness led you to the House of Hope, but also your faithfulness did something for your son and his life, which I think is, uh, is exactly what Kingdom Living is all about. So that's kind of the bread and butter. I'm gonna, I, I kind of just, just set the stage for you. Um, what I would love for you to do is just go ahead and tell people your story. Well... First, I want to tell you thank you, Chris, for trusting me, having faith in me to um, come on here and share my story. Um, I appreciate you and oh, sorry, my phone fell. Um, I appreciate you and Julianne um, so much. Uh, Julianne is one of my closest friends, and she is a, such a faithful friend. So I really appreciate her and you. Um, so my story, um, I could literally, Julianne keeps telling me I need to write a book, but um, I could probably write a mini series about my story. So I hope we're going to do the Reader's Digest version here. Um, so 26 years ago, um, I got the best paying job that I could ever ask for. And I say paying job because raising my son, Danny, is the best 
job I've ever had, um, but I don't get paid for that. So I haven't had a penny yet, except lots of love and kisses and hugs. But um, House of Hope is the best job I ever had. And I've had a pretty exciting life. I've done some really fun things. Um, but working at House of Hope, I was a house parent there. It's a, House of Hope Orlando is a home for teenagers who come from very dysfunctional, abusive backgrounds. Um, a lot of these teenagers that wind up there are court ordered um, because their last stop is juvenile detention center. Okay. Um, a lot of them are cutters, bulimic, um, on the verge of suicide. Some have prostituted themselves. Um, it's, uh, but what's so great about House of Hope is that it isn't just a place where you know, the kids are fixed and then they're returned back to an unhealthy environment. The whole point is to heal the entire family. So the kids have to, it's a residential program. So the kids are there anywhere from eight months to a year and a half. Um, and then they go through counseling. They actually live there. They go to school there. Um, and then the parents are required to go to counseling as well. They're also required to go to parenting classes. And then eventually they wind up um, counseling the parents and the kids together. And that's when the healing really starts to take place. Um, House of Hope has never received a penny of government funding. Um, and the reason being is because it's a faith-based organization. And um, if we were to take government funding, we couldn't talk about God. And that's really where the healing really starts to take place for these kids. So anyway, 26 years ago, um, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's exactly where I was supposed to be. I knew that God had me there at that time for specific girls. For instance, um, there was this one girl named Letitia. My very first day as a house parent was her first day in the program. The day that my last day was the day that she graduated from the program. Um, I knew it was the one job that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was doing exactly what I was called to what do. What you were called to do, yeah. What yeah. I was called to do. Um, and the only reason why I left is because my dad passed away. Um, and I grew up in a very unhealthy, broken family. My stepdad was an alcoholic. I didn't, my real dad left a week before I was born. I didn't even meet my real dad till I was 18. So I grew up in a lot of chaos and I grew up in a lot of, um, hurt. Um, and it was kind of cool because by God bringing me to House of Hope, it was like, I thought I was supposed to be there for the girls, right? But it was really God's way of healing me. Isn't that amazing? You know, yeah. And working, helping me work through my issues, and um, which was amazing. And, I'm, and that's just part of his faithfulness to me. Um, and so when my dad passed away, my biological father, it was really, really hard. Um, because I'd only seen him twice and I had planned on going to stay with him because I knew he would only had like three to six months left to live and I was going to go stay with him. But um, he, he died two weeks later and I never got to see him again. I never even got to say goodbye. And it was really, really hard. So um, I left House of Hope because I knew I just couldn't deal with my own grief as well as helping the girls deal with their stuff. So, but that took me on a path where I was really angry with God for a long time. And so I just decided I was going to do things my own way. And um, I was kind of rebellious during that time. Um, I felt like God was not faithful to me because here, you know, all these years I had either uh, been a leader in my youth group, you know, I had been faithful in my church. I had been faithful to God in this ministry with these girls at House of Hope. And, and then I felt like God was not faithful to me because he didn't even let my dad last long enough for me to get back there. So it was a, it was a really tough time. Um, I moved out to L.A. That's when Julianne and I became really good friends. We were roommates. And um, she was such a huge blessing during that time. But I also, during that time just I wasn't living for God I wasn't living my life the way that I knew that I should have been living um and but that's okay 
because Romans 8, 28 says, for we know that in all things, and I actually had a Bible teacher out there that used to say to me, how many things, Angela? All things. How many? All things. Mm -hmm. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I have been called. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I do love God in my heart. I was just angry and I was bitter and I was resentful. I'm going to so push the pause button on you for one second because I want to reiterate that Yes, that's a Christian concept. Yes, that's something that if you believe in the Christian narrative, then you can have that authority in your life and you can blanket yourself with the knowledge that no matter what has happened to you in your right. life, God will use that for good. That means if you were abused as a child, if you had a alcoholic parents or if death hit early and you had that sting of death and you were ripped out of any kind of comfort zone, God can use all of that stuff, financial uh, desperation, um, personal addiction to things, all of it, God can use for good. But I also want to reiterate for people, because it's such a specific thing for the Christian narrative. It's so specific for the Christian narrative. Um, but there's also this, I know there's a lot of people who are watching who aren't Christians and who don't have that relationship. Um, and there's also something that, that I believe that this God who created us loves every single person that is on this planet doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what faith you abide by. Um, and that, that reaching out for the God, you will have that same, do you know what I mean? And I'm yeah. not trying to, I'm not discrediting Christianity because it's a hundred percent the acceptance of Jesus and, and keep watching the Chautauqua cause we're heading that way. But, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's important that I want people to hear because I think there's a lot of people who are broken right now and who mm -hmm. God will introduce himself before you even meet him. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, like God absolutely. can start working in those people's lives before they even know yep. that there's a name, before they even know who this God is. Well, that's God the... In, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So keep going. So you, okay. So you're in this moment. Keep going. Sorry. That's okay. So um, anyway, long story short, I wind up getting pregnant. Um, and it was very difficult within the first three months of my pregnancy. Um, I was hospitalized three times. I had hyperemesis, um, which means I was just constantly throwing up. I could not keep anything down, water, nothing. So, and I was um, a single mom at that point, even though I was, I, I was a single pregnant mom at that point. Um, my son's biological father was not staying in the picture. Um, so it was during that time that even though I had been so angry with God and I had been so bitter in my heart and, you know, just basically saying, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I really don't care what you want me to do. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. It was during that time that God really started to show his faithfulness. Um, for instance, I, I mean, I couldn't work my, they made me stop working cause I couldn't cause I was throwing up all the time. Um, and, but yet, you know, my electricity was going to get turned off, but friend from work found out and they paid my electric bill. Another work, um, showed up with bags of groceries, um, cause they knew that I didn't have money to buy food. I had all of these, I had cats, you know, me, animal lover. But I had all these cats and um, I didn't have money to go out and buy food for them. And the mailman, Dan, the mailman dropped off the entire box of trial sized cat food rather than bringing, you know, delivering them to each house. He brought the whole box to my house and dropped it at my doorstep for me. And it was just those little things that God just showed his faithfulness over and over. And I literally could write a book just about that time of my right. life and how faithful Where God just God kept showing was. up. God kept showing up. Yeah. Unexpected, beautiful place yeah. that allowed yeah. you to be carrying on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wasn't being faithful. You know what I mean? It's like he kept showing up and kept being faithful. In fact, one of Julianne's good friends at the time offered to send all of my boxes back to Florida, which is where I was moving back from. I didn't have the money to do that, you know? And he was so, God was so faithful and using people you know, who were faithful to me, who were friends yeah. to me. And so um, anyway, I get back home to Florida and my son was born. And um, 
before he turned two years old, he was diagnosed with autism. Um, and again, I was a single mom. I never received a penny of, you know, of support, child support. So that was a really trying time. Um, he couldn't communicate. There were tantrums all the time. Um, and it was just, it was a really difficult time. Um, but again, God has been so faithful in that. So my son was diagnosed with autism when he was two. Um, he was nonverbal till he was about four. He couldn't even put a sentence together till he was seven years old. He was on autism classes all the way through his first year of fourth grade until he finally started to mainstream. And well, you know Danny now. I and know Danny. I held Danny when he was a baby. I remember when he was a baby. I remember when he was about two and not really talking, or three and not really talking. Yeah. Yeah. And I know him now, which is. I still like have a pair of shoes that, uh, that you and Julianne bought him, his first pair of shoes. That he walked. That's, I still, that's awesome. And we still, I don't know if you remember, remember that cowboy, that um, cowboy, it was the, the dachshund, uh, it was a stuffed animal. It was yeah, a little, little dachshund. Dog. Like, yeah. And you guys signed it when we went to California. Anyway, we saw that too. Yeah. So, but anyway, so um, when Danny was diagnosed, and I, when I talk about Daniel and his diagnosis, I will never say that Danny has autism because I don't believe in labeling. I don't believe in putting that over him. Um, it's his diagnosis. It's just part of who he is. It doesn't define him. It's not who he is, but that's when my heart started to change. And that's when my heart started to turn back to God and to start finding that faithfulness again um, for, you know, doing what's right and my faithfulness to my son. I mean, nothing else, I think, you know, has ever been as important to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So started therapy right after he turned two. And today he is an amazing testimony. Um, he's, well, for three years in a row, he won Best Actor in his high school musicals. And I'm going to hit the pause button one more time on your story because this isn't something that's easy for you to say about yourself because it's your narrative, first person. But having known you, I think it is fair to say that you are somebody that has had the shit kicked out of her consistently and for a very, very long time, right? And when Danny was born, everyone was saying, yeah, it's pretty bad. Like the autism, he's probably never going to relate to people. He's probably never going to really talk. And you did. And why you're here and why I wanted you to follow Scott was because what you did was you single-handedly, and I watched it firsthand. I witnessed it. And it was a miracle, Angela. And the work that you put into him and the love that you poured into him and the faithfulness and the endless encouragement and the endless belief that there was a corner that you could come around now, I don't want this to be one of those things where there's other people out there who have children who have autism, and this may not be the case for them. Right. And they may have a, a child that will never relate to the world in a way that is like what Danny is doing. Um, and they'll be like, well, why did God give Angela this kid that gets right? And everyone has their own stories. I remember when we were in church, one family is able to adopt a kid while another couple couldn't have a baby. And they were like, well, why is God doing this for them and not for us? And so it's complicated. And I can't explain it in a Chautauqua in an hour. But what I will say for you, specifically for you, and the story that you get to have, and your story, and your legacy, is that you did this unbelievable thing that was real work, was real effort, and it was an act of faithfulness. And Danny is 100%, I mean, started here, and is here, like, and he's on stage, and he's singing, and he's acting, and he is talking. I mean, we call him Danny Brave Dragon because it's like, and that's what, like, he's just this amazing, amazing guy. And yes, God is good. And Danny's an amazing person. But the one who did the work is you. <laughs> and I think it's okay. Are you still with me? You're rendering for some reason. Are you with me? Angela, are you with me? It's, it's, Okay, we're good. You know, it's this the Chautauqua true. doesn't like compliments very much. The Chautauqua, I think it's going to play back in real time. I think it's going to be okay. Um, 
but what I do want to say okay. is, um, is I think that, that you're an example of kingdom living because it's up to us to do the work. It's up to us to be the ones who are patient and kind and full of goodness and faithful. Um, and it doesn't mean just believing in God and hoping that everything's going to work out great and honky dory. It's about saying, yeah, I know that God has a purpose for my life and then pushing towards that. Anyway, keep, so tell us the, so end up, so now you've got Danny and there's been this amazing turnaround and let's cut to like the last couple of uh, maybe weeks for your life. Well, I do need to go back just a little bit because God was faithful though too in bringing my husband, okay. Michael, when Danny was six okay. years old. Um, because that's an important part. You know, I can't leave, I can't leave him out because he has been a faithful dad, you know, raising this kid right. who's not his own. Um, and by choice being dad, you know, so I think that that's, um, that's really important to, to mention. Um, so Danny has come so far, so much further than any of us could ever even possibly imagine. Um, the doctors told me that he would possibly never be able to talk. He may never be able to go to high school or he may never graduate from school. Well, let me just tell you, he graduated uh, magna cum laude um, from his high school with a 3.9 GPA. Um, we homeschooled for the last year, last two and a half years of school and this, his senior year we spent in New York City um, for him to take professional acting classes and we use those as his high school electives. So- And you went um, tables to support this whole thing the whole time. Yeah, yeah. So I was not my favorite job, but you know, mom's got to do what a mom's got to do. So, well, actually that takes me to, so in March, um, on my way to work while we were in New York, I fractured my ankle March 2nd, my sister's birthday on my way to work. Oh, it was awful. Um, and then literally March 17th, New York shut down because of COVID. And then we were stuck there for like two months. And then we finally made it home. But because of my ankle, I couldn't go back to doing what I was doing. Not that I really ever wanted to, but you know, it was a job and it was decent money. money. Yeah. So, um, so I just, I've been praying. I've been praying for a long time, you know, I will, and I've gotten to that point where before where when I'm was so angry with God, I'm going to do things my own way. My whole mind, set has done a complete 180. So now it's not, I'm going to do what I want to do. I will do whatever you want me to do. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. If you want me to clean toilets for the rest of my life, I will do that. If you want me to homeschool my son, I will do that. Whatever it is you want me to do. It's like just a complete surrender. And I think that really is faithfulness because you have to trust, you have to have faith and something so much bigger than yourself to say, open up the right doors, slam the wrong door shut. And that has been my prayer. God, just open up the right doors and slam the wrong one shut so that I have no doubt whatsoever what you want me to do. Because I don't ever want to be in that place where I was all those years ago where I was trying to do it on my own because it didn't work out so well. You know, I would much rather be exactly where I was supposed to be, like when I was at House of Hope and I knew it. So I've been praying that and we were in church one morning and um, there's this song that I'd never heard before. And it said, um, I will make a way for you to do what you want me to do. And I didn't really like the way that was worded because it was like, I'm going to make a way, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I mean, it's a beautiful song, but so as soon as we started singing it, I, in my mind, I just changed the words to, I surrender to you to do whatever you want me to do. And um, literally within, I think, three days, I got a call from uh, House of Hope. And um, they have come back and work at House of Hope. And I can't say what my position at House of Hope will be because we have a big reveal on December 3rd. So if you want to find out, you got to watch the Threads of Hope video, um, which is a live event on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. But, um, but it, it's just so amazing how 26 years ago God knew exactly where I was yeah. going to be and he knew what I needed to go through in order to get back to this place in order to get back to this place where I just at complete surrender I will do whatever you want to do and and in that time 
you know, th there is a, uh, and I, you know, I, you're right. For me, it's hard because it is my narrative and I don't like to put the spotlight on myself. Um, yeah. But there is a, there is an amount of faithfulness on our part, which is a choice. Um, so, you know, even though I've been on unemployment <laughs> for, for months now, you know, I've been faithful to tithe you know, that little bit, because the, the unemployment isn't much, but, you know, just faithful to tithe that little bit. Um, and God is just being so faithful, so much more than I could ever even ask for. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, and I wish I could share more about it, but I got to wait. So I love it. I love it. Um, I love for, for, but, for people who don't know about tithing. Um, biblically, Christians are, are called to tithe 10%. And I give my agent 10%. I give my manager 10%. We give the government, you know, 23 to 45%. Um, and so God asked early on for people to give 10. And so Christians who, who actually faithfully do that, um, and I love that you're in a situation where every penny counts and you're still like, mm -hmm. I'm going to take 10% and let God have it. Um, yeah. Which is really, really beautiful and faithful. Um, well, because that's where he just keeps blessing. You know what I mean? It's like every time I turn around, there's blessing upon blessing. And, you know, God has just been so faithful. I mean, I, I know that you really, you, you were, you wanted me to come on and share, you know, like how I, how I've been, but honestly, I feel like I have not deserved the faithfulness that I have received because I know that I'm so imperfect, you know, and I'm, I try to be, you know, literally, um, and families that are broken and torn apart, you know, to be able to be a part of helping those families to heal again. So the faithfulness, um, there's definitely a degree, I think, on our parts, but, um, and I think faithfulness is being real. It's, it's being honest. It's being honest with other people. It's being honest with yourself. It's being honest with who you are, um, who you want to be, who you choose to be. Choice, we, choice is so huge in all of it. Because we, and I tell my son that's all the time. You have a choice. You choose who you want to be, you know? It's an um, it's active. Yeah, it's yeah. active. It's yeah. like that quote from Confucius. It's sincerity and faithfulness. Being being honest, yeah. someone was saying how faithfulness can lead to manipulation if you're trying to like get stuff out of people and but it's about being really sincere in that yeah. faith. Just being I love the idea of being led by God. And I love that you went on this journey that took twenty six years and it was hard. And it wasn't cushy and it wasn't, you know, this fun Hollywood like you know, like, like there are certain people who are led one way and you're like, wow, that's a really fun story. Yours is a really <laughs> tough story. Um, <laughs> and it was really, really Never. hard, but, um, but your strength and your courage, you're so powerful, Angela. And whenever mm -hmm. I'm around you, I'm just like, don't mess with this woman. Really? Like, yeah, you really are. <laughs> and I think that the more you grow into that and the more you, and I think this new job, which will be revealed on December 3rd, is going to be such a blessing, not just um, everybody that you're going to that you're going to deal with, but to you as well. Like, like you said early on, it wasn't as much the kids like you were being fed, which mm -hmm. is anytime you ever do a mission work, you're like, wow, I'm actually not the one I'm not doing the help. I'm actually being helped. Um, right. I've got to be cognizant of time only because I've got to go have a, a reading with the Life Unexpected cast, doing like a reunion reading. Um, which is going to be the sixth. So houseofhopeorlando.org, www.houseofhopeorlando.org. Is that correct? That's, that's right, right? I think we're glitching again. Um, are you there? I can't hear you. I don't know. Anyway, you it's December 3rd is your fundraiser. And if you guys are watching, yeah, I can hear you now. Um, Anyway, love you, Angela. And I'll post okay, stuff no, uh, to remind people yeah, to go and check out the, the, the live show. Thank you.
Thank you. Love you too. Appreciate I think it'll, you. I hope um, it's going to play when it, when it downloads, it'll all work out pretty smooth. So, um, all right. Good night, Angela. Bye. Thanks bye. for having thank me. Told you, Lana you. and the kids. Okay. Bye. Um, there you go. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to go. I gotta go do a table read with the with the cast of Life, Life Unexpected, which you can see December sixth through the uh, ATX. Um, faithfulness is falling blindly, something you can't see, going somewhere you don't know. Noah built an ark. Abraham went into the desert. Moses led his people to the promised land. Caleb, in the Bible, went into the promised land because of faithfulness, in spite of the giants that lived there. Christ went up on the cross at Golgotha out of faithfulness. So my question to you is, where will you go? Where will you be led? Thank you so much for tuning in to the Palaha Chautauqua with me, your friend and host, Christopher Palaha. There is swag. You can buy it. Go to my page if you want a t-shirt that says Palaha Chautauqua or a little beanie or a hat. Um, I would love to just continue to build the brand out. Um, because I think what we're doing here is, is, is awesome. And I think it's essential and I think it's cool. Um, and I would love to share it. So, so spread the word and, uh, you guys, I pray that you have a really amazing week. Lord, I lift up the group of people that are watching right now. I lift up Scott and Angela and every single person that is a part of this community watching live, watching throughout the week, the thousands of people that watch throughout the week. Uh, and I just lift them up to you, Father God. I pray that you just bless their hearts explode love inside their hearts help them be just these beaming balls of light and energy and love to be full expressions of the human experience to be kingdom livers to be living the kingdom here on earth in jesus name i pray peace out dudes uh awesome hour i will go live with you guys next week i'm sorry i didn't get to bring anybody else on uh, I love talking to everybody. Uh, Gail and Sarah and Paula are in the wings trying to say hi. Oh, Paula, you did it. <laughs> Paula F. Um, there are so many people. So I would love to say hi to y'all, but uh, I got to go. So we'll do it next week. Bye-bye.